Tucked away at the end of Central Avenue, looking over the Thames River, is 90 Central. Known as the Bishop's Palace, Ferberet, and Blackfriars, this historic house was built in 1876 by architect William Robinson of London for Thomas Kent. I knew when I first arrived at 90 Central that it was an historic place and uh, that it had been uh, owned by the Kent family. This house was built by Thomas Kent in 1876. But the real history of the property goes back to about the 1820s when John Kent was granted uh, a great deal of property up and down the river. Stretching all the way to Richmond Street on the eastern side. When he died, the, the estate went, into his, uh, went to his son, and his son started to sell off the, uh, the original land grant to the growing city of London, and of course became very wealthy. He was also into finance as well. And he built 90 Central as sort of a testimony to his new wealth. But at the time, it sat alone right on the top of the river cliff. And if you see old pictures, you can see how it stood out from all its neighbors. And of course, there were no large trees around in those days to shade it. Building your house on top of the hill facing river showed prestige. Thornwood and Eldon House are other examples of this in London. Today, John and Kent Streets are named in his honor. According to Thomas Kent's memoir, the western part of Central Avenue was originally called Litchfield Street after his father's Staffordshire home. Thomas Kent and his wife lived there until they died um, because, and they were childless, so the house actually went into their estate. But of course what interested me particularly was that uh, the fifth the Bishop of uh, London, uh, who had been living in Buffalo when he was appointed the Bishop of London. He was uh, actually a, an oblate priest who had originally come from Kingston, studied in Ottawa, been an oblate in Ottawa, and then, uh, you know, in some kind of dispute with the French oblates, ended up in the northern uh, New York province. And it's from there that he was brought to London as bishop. And um, uh, I think that prior to his time, the bishops of London had been living in the Cathedral Rectory, which was right on Dufferin Street, right beside St. Peter's Cathedral. A man named uh, Donnelly, he was an admirer of Bishop Fallon, bought the house and gave it to Bishop Fallon. And so it became from that moment on the uh, habitation of the bishops. 90 Central is described as uh, Italianate or neoclassical, and what that means is that it's influenced by classical architecture, Roman architecture from Italy. But it's more of an eclectic, it's a mix, you know, that's why it's Italianate or Romanesque rather than literally sticking to the rules of classical architecture. This white brick structure is designed in the Italianate style and there are a couple of key features that make the house stand out. There are paired eave brackets under the roof, complemented by the decorative brickwork of the cornice having those brackets and especially pairing them so they look more visually stable. They're completely decorative, but they're very important visually as part of that style of buildings um, because it makes the overhang look like it's supported visually. It doesn't need it structurally. The overhang, you know, is part of the roof structure. It's referring back to classical stone buildings, right? That's how the Greeks would have had to do it. They would have had to use stone brackets to hold up the edges of the roof because everything was built out of masonry. The windows have protruding eared brick surrounds and textured keystones over the segmented arches. While textured keystones above windows are a very common feature of many older buildings and uh, it's part of emphasizing the opening because the wall is meant to look strong and massive when we cut a hole in it right, and make a window opening. Um, it helps us um, if that looks like it's strongly supported by, you know, a structural piece that arches over the window open. And, uh, you know, the keystone in the center is also part of that traditional way that you would make an arched opening. You know, there's probably a lintel that's actually supporting the opening in behind, and these things are decorative. The house is also slightly projected and framed by brick coins, which frame all four corners of the house. 
The coins are those little projections, and you see them a lot on a contemporary houses. They're a popular feature of, of uh, modern homes as well. Right at the corner of the uh, walls, there are those projections. They sort of look like blocks that are built out, you know, at the corner and kind of wrap around each corner. Uh, traditionally, those would have been stone, and in some buildings, they are actually done with stone. More commonly, including in this example, you know, it's, uh, it's brick. Once Bishop Fallon had the house, he added the Georgian porch. Designed by the firm of Munro and Moore, which was one of the most eminent architectural firms in London, this is a very impressive portico and changes the character of the house entirely. The two styles, one classical, one Italianate, do actually meld quite well in this particular property. And there is no doubt that today we only think of the house with the portico on it and cannot imagine what it was like without it. It's really the front portico and the porch that makes it more Romanesque or neoclassical than the rest of the building. The rest of the building is, you know, a kind of typical brick center hall structure, but um, obviously somebody made the decision to make a very prominent entrance and the way they did that was to use pretty traditional Roman columns and details and you know the pediments and so forth all are part of that. I, I, I loved the big columns on the front and I, I loved the front veranda. It was a place where you could sit out and relax uh, uh, you know particularly after the spring came and genuinely and uh, it was a beautiful place to sit out and it had marvelous privacy because it looked out toward the river. And initially uh, there had been some kind of a pathway down to the river. Uh, and uh, probably there was tr transportation on the river that utilized this path coming up. The beautiful thing was that uh, it was at the end of Central Avenue, which overlooked the Blackfriars Bridge, which itself is an historical artifact in the city of London. The fact that there was no through traffic meant that we maintained a, a real sense of privacy and almost a cloistered sense uh, about the place. So whenever we were sitting out, we were uh, private. Uh, we, were, uh, we, we were very comfortable and uh, it was just a, a lovely place to be. Later on, closed in the second story porch, what was a walkout probably a screened-in porch, he made it into a part of the inside of the house. It's a closed-in balcony over top of the, of, of the veranda. And of course, it was winterized. And I used it as an office, and I used it as a place for playing music when I was trying to relax in the evenings. Uh, that was uh, one of the, my places, but it's a place apparently because it was all, it was just a place of light, it was all windows. And um, I, I guess uh, Bishop Fallon died of diabetes just on the eve of the discovery of insulin. And uh, he died uh, apparently there in that little room over the veranda. Uh, but I, I liked that particular quality of it as well. And then there was also some additions to the side of the house, which I think as well happened possibly in Bishop Cody's time to make the living room and the dining room larger. Over the years, while the bishops lived at 90 Central, a number of historical figures either stayed at the home or corresponded with its residents. Bishop Emmett Carter hosted a reception for Cardinal Carol Whitola, also known as John Paul II, which is now St. John Paul II. This was a reception that had gone on because the bishop had come to know the cardinal quite well through their time during the Second Vatican Council. In 1976, I received a telephone call from Bishop Carter, who was then the bishop and was then living in 90 Central. He called me in August of 1976. He said, I'm having a visitor. Uh, coming. He said, it's uh, Cardinal Wojtyla from Krakow in Poland. He's coming to, uh, to invite me to Poland. Would you like to meet him? I said, I'd love to meet him. So I, he said, I went over to 90 Central and who was there but the future Saint John Paul II. And he and Bishop Carter were having a conversation. That's the first time I had the opportunity to meet 
the future John Paul. And that went, as he left the house, there was a Polish priest uh, from Detroit who was driving him and as he said goodbye and left, Bishop Carter said to me, you know that man's going to be the next Pope. <laughs> Bishop Carter was wrong by one month. There was a John Paul I who was Pope for a month and then came John Paul the uh, second. Now remember that was in 1976 and he was made Pope in 1978, so two years later. Not too many people in London can say that a saint slept in their house. Actually, he slept in what is now my living room. Uh, so, yeah, every once in a while I'm a little awestruck by that. That's pretty neat. The sorority home that was situated beside 90 Central was known to be quite friendly with the bishop, Bishop Carter, that is. In fact, there are correspondence that show that the sorority sisters in the 60s had invited the bishop over for dinner and it was often returned, the favor was returned where the bishop would then have the sorority sisters come for dinner at 90 Central. In a way, the world touched London through this house. Not a lot of people know that and we wanted to celebrate that history. We have an on-site archive which uh, we've been working on with the diocese and with other people in London. So we have a lot of documentation, a lot of artifacts that have been given to us and are that we've collected in the project. One of the things we're really proud of is almost every Prime Minister from Laurier through to Prime Minister Trudeau has written uh, to the residents of this house or even directly to the house and that was of course the bishops. We have a wonderful letter from the White House to Bishop Fallon from Teddy Roosevelt. It's wonderful because it's hand corrected and then signed by Theodore Roosevelt which is just a wonderful thing. One of my favorite letters is a letter to Cardinal Carter from, uh, uh, from Prime Minister Pearson thanking his lordship for his help with the new Canadian flag. So it was a London resident who had a say in the Maple Leaf which I, I, I'm sure very few Londoners know about. Actually, a historical figure that was very uh, uh, involved with Bishop uh, Fallon is uh, Sir Adam Beck. There's a wonderful series of warm letters between uh, Sir Adam Beck's mansion and 90 Central um, at the turn of the century. Uh, Bishop Fallon and Sir Adam Beck had a very warm relationship, uh, especially in their later years. From the standpoint of the Diocese of London, it was a very important place. It had been the bishop's dwelling place uh, for 65 years when I moved in. Now, I never really appreciated the uh, historical beauty and, uh, of the place. I enjoyed living there, but I lived really only in a corner of it. I very rarely used uh, a lot of the space. And, uh, and was so busy that I thought of it, you know, as just the place where I slept rather than the place where I lived. <laughs> uh, but of course, people were interested in it. And uh, on, we used to have an open house on a regular basis. So, I mean, I was well aware of the historical importance and the degree to which it was considered one of the uh, outstanding houses in London. Uh, but uh, uh, that didn't uh, have the impact on me that it might have had on some other person who was a little more, uh, you know, uh, was spent more time there and was more sensitive to, to the historical beauty. Since 1912, six bishops have called 90 Central home. In 2006, the mansion was put up for sale by the diocese after it had become too costly to maintain. Well, my history with 90 Central goes back uh, to the time probably when I was a teenager. I knew of the house um, because of my Catholic roots. My aunt uh, was actually Bishop Sherlock's housekeeper back in the day. Uh, so I used to see the house, you know, probably from the time I was 18, 19 on. And uh, so I had been in the house several times over the years. I first heard that it was for sale probably in 2007 and then um, of course we actually took possession of it August 1st, 2008. When we got the house, and this is, there's no secret to this, it was listed as one of the historical houses in danger. 
Uh, towards the, the end of the time of uh, the diocese having it, the house was no longer being cared for properly um, and it was in danger. The water was starting to run through it. There was significant damage inside. Uh, luckily, it's uh, triple brick construction all the way through with the original plaster on brick. Solid masonry wall construction was a traditional method um, that was used especially a lot for a lot of larger houses. Now we use more wood frame construction and the masonry or brick is as a veneer on the front. I think it has to do mainly with the amount of nails and fasteners you need when you're building a wood frame house. Brick was more readily available, you know, masonry skills were common. So she's a tough old girl, and, uh, but we did get it just at the right time. Um, so the first thing we did was put a new roof on it to stop the, uh, the water damage. The property had been let go a fair amount as well, so the first thing we did was get on the grounds. Um, we were hooking my Jeep up to wild vines and pulling them out of trees, actually pulled trees. They were so badly overgrown that we actually pulled trees down unintentionally. Then we had to envision how we could take what was essentially a single family residence, all one house, and divide it up into four condominiums. Because we're so committed to the historical nature of the house, Number one rule was to uh, protect as much as possible of the original aspects of the house. You can very much see the original rooms. A lot of them are untouched. They knew that the house was historical and there were rumors of some hidden gems. But what they didn't know was just how many secrets were to be uncovered. When we started to peel away the three layers of wallpaper, for instance, in the entry hallway, we found uh, coats of arms from Bishop Fallon. He had brought over painters and they had done unique uh, frescoes on the walls uh, in the entryway. So there's an um, Episcopal coat of arms and a um, Marian coat of arms uh, when you walk in the front doors that no one knew was there. So I'd go to work and come home and it'd be like, oh my God, what did they discover today? Um, so when we started to uncover this, this kind of historical stuff, we thought, well, we can't, we're not going to cover it back up. But that meant we had to restore it. And we integrated them into our original plan for condominiums. Discovering Bishop Fallon's frescoes underneath years of old wallpaper led the homeowners wondering what history was still to be exposed. The original 1870s floors were wonderfully protected underneath of wall-to-wall -wall carpet. So I was really happy about that. I hate wall-to-wall -wall carpet and I love original uh, mahogany inlaid floors, which is what we found. All we had to do was restore them. And then we built modern kitchens around them, modern bathrooms, always reflecting the original Victorian grandeur of the house. One of the challenges uh, that we had in updating the house was tying in the modern kitchens and bathrooms into the flavor of the house. And uh, luckily we had uh, one of our owners is Dr. John DeMarco and he's a mosaic artist. He uh, lended his talents to creating some wonderful original works of art in our kitchens that again are reflective of a more classical uh, sort of approach. So they're very custom, very much ties into the uh, Victorian nature, the historical nature of the house and yet updates it and is part of a modern kitchen. One of the other things that was very exciting when we got into repairing some aspects of the front of the house, especially in the front porch area, things started to appear. Inside the wall, there's a little plaque and it says builders and it lists names. Uh, two of them are Maggi brothers. It gives the date, I think it's April 1913. Really what they were doing is they were creating their own uh, time capsule. You know, it's very easy to celebrate the history of great men and famous men like Cardinal Watia and all the other characters that we've spoken about. But for the average working man, that was a way that they became immortal. It was always rumor that there was a chapel. Once when it was being, the, that room was being repainted and so on, they stripped the wallpaper from the wall. And to my surprise, I mean, the last uh, wallpaper that I saw there was uh, ecclesiastical. It looked like it was religious art. And uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if that had been the original chapel. Bolstered by this rumor from Bishop Sherlock that there was something underneath the wallpaper, 
co-owner Peter Hayes started peeling back the paper, and what he found gave him goosebumps. And he peeled away the first layer of wallpaper, and he could see uh, almost a life-size head of an angel. He thought, wow, that's pretty neat. And then he continued to peel, and he could see that there was a, a crest with an open book with a papal seal on it, but he, and there was also writing, but he couldn't see what the writing was. So he started to wash away the glue, and out of the uh, glue appeared the words in Latin, tu es Petrus, which is in Latin, you are Peter. So Peter was completely freaked out and said, okay, the house is talking to me. <laughs> Uh, but that was so exciting. So as we started to pull down the paper all through what would become the kitchen of that unit, there were crests with these life-sized heads of angels. When you cook in the kitchen, it's a very gothic experience. There's angels looking down at you and crests representing the papal crown. There's a immaculate heart. There's a sacred heart one. And very, very wonderful. And again, um, there was some damage just uh, over time and just fixed up them enough to maintain them because we wanted them to still have that legitimate aged look that they have. One of the most striking features of 90 Central is its central hall design with the suites on either side. The central staircase is very grand. It's uh, the original oak. Uh, the city allowed us to keep the original rails which are below standard because they're so historical. On the post at the bottom of the staircase is a statue of St. Michael the Archangel stomping on the primordial serpent, Satan, and he's got a big staff, and out of his back comes a, a light post. So uh, when I put the offer in on the house to the, the bishops, uh, to the bishop, I uh, asked that that, be, that that be left there. And I also asked that the two, there were two beautiful stained glass windows in the later Bishop's Chapel. I asked for those as well. I knew that those would not be allowed to stay because the church always removes anything that has a, um, a spiritual uh, uh, history to it. So they said no to the uh, stained glass windows. But they did say yes to the St. Michael uh, statue. What they didn't know, but I knew, was that uh, that there was an inscription, you couldn't see it, it said, to Bishop Fallon from the students from the Pines. I knew that that was a, a gift to Bishop Fallon from the Pines School in Chatham, uh, which had a French background. At the time, Bishop Fallon had stated that he thought Canada should have English as its first language, not French. As well, his priest should be ordained in London, not Montreal, where his students were failing, which led to St. Peter's Seminary. That gift was a little bit tongue-in-cheek of, uh, you know, we're here too. And the great thing about Bishop Fallon, uh, who I, I found an, an incredible historical character, is that he got the tongue-in-cheek nature of the gift and he put it right there in his hallway and, and celebrated the fact that they were part of the community, even though there was that controversy. I knew that history. That history had been forgotten by some people, I think, because I got an, after they accepted the deal, I got a call from the diocese saying, oh, I made a mistake. Uh, Deborah Major came through and saw that we were leaving the statue of St. Michael. And uh, I said, yeah, I know it's historical, isn't it? And he said, yeah. And he says, well, I was, we ended up negotiating it out and it stayed. And I think Deb is quite happy that it did. To keep the history of the house alive, the current owners have named each of the suites after the significant people who have had something to do with the home. One condominium, for instance, is the John Donnelly condo, the Fabray suite, which is the original name of the house for the Kents, um, and there's also the Bishop Fallon suite and the Kent suite. You really have a sense in the house of, not ghosts, but certainly the spirit of this house is very, very strong. Um, Bishop Fallon has been sort of one of our leading uh, 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 inspirations in this whole project. We know that he loved this house. There's a real sense in the house that it has been a place of that people have loved living in. I, I know Bishop Fabro has been quoted as saying that it was a wonderful place to live, that it was so nice to be able to go for a walk. So there, the spirit of the house is caught up in the people who lived and died in the house. And we all feel really good about that. Uh, so we enjoy celebrating that history and we're enjoying creating our own history here. It's nice to see the house living and breathing and developing a new life as well. Yeah, I, I suppose we simply uh, 
rather than uh, realizing how privileged we were to be utilize, to be there. I mean, we just got used to it. It was just home, or the place where we, we ate when we were home and uh, enjoyed it. I liked living there. Can't believe I live here sometimes. Uh, we all talk about that. I love the house because it's historical. I love the house because now it's my home. And I love the transformation that, we, that has happened here. I feel like actually it's my uh, uh, something I'm giving back to the community because I know that 90 Central Blackfriars State Condominiums will be here when I'm gone and that kind of excites me. Like you think about all these people I've been speaking about and how they're alive in our memory, well now I'm part of that history and part of that memory and I think all of us who did this feel that way. So um, there's a uh, there's a certain, I, I feel like we've joined in on the history so that's probably my reason I love the house the most. And let's face it, it's just a wonderful place to live. Mm -hmm.